Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the chance we have to worship you in the study of your word. We're grateful for the friendships in this room. We're grateful for the good things that you do in and around our lives. Now, Father, even in my own journey of uh, laying to rest my father-in-law yesterday, it just reminds me of what matters most. And Father, uh, study of your word is one of those things that is precious and special. And I pray, Lord, you would grow us to be the men and women you've called us to be through this study. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, guys, welcome again. And uh, I'm technically on bereavement leave right now, but I said I'm still doing my Bible class. And uh, I'm going to still do grief share tomorrow night. Um, but I uh, wanted to continue uh, the journey. And I, I love teaching the Bible. And the secret little reason is because I get to learn. And the teacher always learns more you know, than the students because you have to go through the material. And uh, I think it's a great exercise. I love that Pastor Seth is now teaching Carl's former class because it's getting Seth regularly in the Word and studying it and, and preparing. And uh, there's uh, great things ahead. Hey, I have a quick question. In the summer at Grace, do like does Carl's class did that go all summer long? Yeah, that's good to know. I'm gonna hold after we're done with Mark in three weeks. Um, we're not gonna have another midweek Tuesday class until the fall kicks in. Um, but uh, we'll continue then. I'll tell Seth to we'll continue the Thursday class all through the summer. Um, I have to figure out the grooves of you know what takes place in the summertime here um, because. You know, we have we say goodbye to some snowbirds, and uh, we have some new faces. Uh, who's going to stick out the 110, 115 degree weather? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I have to learn all that stuff. Last summer was my first summer here, and uh, I will admit it was hot. <laughs> I have to tell you, Pastor. One of the snowbirds asked me, "Do you close the church in the summer?" <laughs> <laughs> no. It's it is funny though because. Um, as you you know unfold everything every all the language i used in new york for winter we use here for summer you know because the other three seasons here are from heaven you know because and it really comes down to one person told me it's really seven miserable weeks i mean it's it's or you could say more generally july and august you know are the you know bitter heat but I found June last year not bad. As long as it's like 100 or under, it's actually not bad at all, particularly in the morning and the evening. Um, yeah. It's only when it crosses that 100 mark that it's like, it's hot out there, baby. <laughs> Just yes, go yes. And go and do like you do in the East when it's cold. You go yes, and do yes. What you have to do. In any case, enough about the, the weather. Let's okay. dive into our luscious test. Now, Liz, we give a quiz every class because I actually expect students to learn. So it's at the end of your scripture. You'll see a quiz that you can take a look at. Um, and first one is this. The parable of the vineyard, which we talked about last week, may have reminded the religious leaders of... Isaiah 5, God's judgment on Israel, a good glass of wine, the grapes of wrath. And it is these first two. The Isaiah 5 passage in which the Lord says prophetically through Isaiah, I planted a vineyard, I took care of it, um, is become throughout Scripture metaphorical for the people of Israel. And that is, you know, what God wants. I took care of you. I, I preserved you. I protected you. And so when Jesus refers to a vineyard and these religious leaders, they know he's talking about them in terms of their, they're not holding to what the Lord wanted. Number two, in the vineyard parable, the son of the owner is clearly David, the beloved of the father, God, Jesus, John. Now, I put Jesus, but you could also successfully put B. So if you put B, that's right. I actually gave my wife the wrong set of answers there when she made this for me. Um, but B would be correct also. Number three, when Jesus debated with the Sadducees, he pointed out their lack of faith, 
their rejection of marriage, their rejection of Psalms, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. And the primary answer is this one, not knowing the scriptures, but um, this idea of their rejection of Psalms, you could put that. It's not, it's secondary. The Sadducees only held to the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It, it's not that they didn't like the other books. They didn't view them as scripture. And so they, didn't, they rejected Psalms as a biblical from God uh, book. Now, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees did. So whenever Jesus affirmed the resurrection of the dead, the, the Pharisees are like, amen. But the Sadducees, uh, Jesus would be in the Pharisaical school when it came to that. Now, here's a quick way of learning the Sadducees. They don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, so they are sad, you see. <laughs> so if you want a way of learning the distinction of the Sadducees, it's because they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. It's a cute little thing I learned in Sunday school at some point. Um, it's not as confusing as it seems when you look at the religious leaders of the day. You'll say, you know, the scriptures will say the scribes and uh, Pharisees, or sometimes it mentions the Sadducees. But basically, the scribes and the Pharisees, they are people who take notes and are keepers of the intelligentsia. Uh, but the Sadducees are all associated with um, the cult of the temple. Uh, what I mean by cult, don't confuse it with like Mormonism or something like that. It just means those associated with all the stuff relating to the sacrifices. The Sadducees were the ones in power. They were the ones connected to the king, Herod. They were the ones who were um, the highly affluent. The Pharisees are more middle class or even poor. Um, but they are the ones who had more of the sway of the people. Number four, two coins were mentioned in class. Which ones? Now, one of them I definitely mentioned by name, but the other one I didn't give you a name. It's a leptin, a leptin. And so that is when you hear in the old King James, the widow's mite, or she had two mites. That is the leptin. Um, but the Nenarius is the one that you're most familiar. And it's kind of fun right now because my father-in-law left us so many coins, and I mean so many. Right now my wife, while I'm here, she's at Boulder Dam Credit Union handing in uh, probably $4,000 worth of quarters. Oh quarters. And this is not special value. These are just, they're worth 25 cents. So if you can imagine how heavy her delivery is right there that I have left my wife to. <laughs> They're rolled, you know, and so they don't have to go through a machine, hopefully. I heard it's up to the teller. Some tellers want to crack the roll and run them through the machine because they don't want to be short. But other tellers are like, no, I'll take the roll as is. <laughs> yes, exactly. But anyway, the denarius, if you look it up on uh, Google, it is now, like if you get a denarius, it can be worth about 10 grand. Wow. Now there were a lot of them, so a lot of them come down through us in history, you can buy them. But um, it was a, now it's a very expensive coin, uh, obviously, a long time ago, 2,000 years. What is the greatest command in the Bible according to Jesus? Leviticus 19, 18. It is these two. The first one, Deuteronomy 6, 5, it's called for the Jew, the Shema. The Shema is the first Hebrew word meaning hear. And they call it that. Do you know the Shema? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your or, or might, and with your strength. And then he goes on to say, teach it to your children. Walk around along the road when you sit down. Nail it to the wall of your, of your house. And so if you go into a Jewish household, 
you will see on the door post a little metal thing it's usually hit on sideways and every jewish home particularly orthodox they have that it's just it's like the size of a finger and what they have in that is the shema mm. they actually keep that scripture because it says in the scripture hang it on your door frame and so they do they put in the door frame. and they'll say bind it to your forehead and your wrist if you go to certain parts of Brooklyn where the Orthodox Jews are, you will see they will have these phylacteries. It's a little wooden thing they put on their wrist or on their forehead as their, I think it's called daubing. It's, it's when you pray like this. Um, but they pray with the Shema bound to their hand and to their forehead. I think other Jews would say it, it's not meant to be literal in that sense but it means surround yourself with the word of god but they make it very literal so if you go into a jewish household they always when they come in they touch the shema and then go into the house it's just kind of uh, respecting that now the leviticus one is love your neighbor as yourself and so jesus says all the law hangs on these two things Love the uh, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And then when it comes to love your neighbor as yourself, that is the heart. I mentioned last week, this is a bonus, that the Jewish community, Orthodox community in particular, they gave a number to all the laws in the first five books of the Bible. Does anyone remember what that number was? 613. Excellent. <coughs> That's a lot of law. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they measured it out. Number six, when Jesus overturns the money changers' tables, he quotes which prophet? He actually quotes two, but only one is listed here. No, but Jeremiah is correct. The other one is Isaiah, but that I didn't put up here. But Isaiah is my house should be called a house of prayer. And, you, and then he says, but you have made it a den of thieves, which is Jeremiah. So he quotes two prophets, but Jeremiah is you've made it a den of thieves. Number seven, the only chance a camel can go through the eye of a needle is a major diet. It can never go through the eye of a needle. C, if it is a calf, D, if it crawls. B. B is the answer. The eye of the needle in the ancient world, contrary to many sermons you may have heard in your youth, is not a small gate in Jerusalem. It is the same kind of eye of the needle as you have. And a camel or person can never go through the eye of a needle. And It, it's just, you see, there is a small gate in Jerusalem in the ancient world called the Sheep's Gate. And it's, it was just like high enough for the sheep can come in. But that, I think, got combined with other thoughts that Jesus must be referring to that. But he's trying to make an example that, no, you can't get to heaven by, you know, working. You get to heaven by God's kindness. That's the only way. And so this idea, well, if you crawl in, if you lose weight, if you do this, you know, you're missing the entire point of the passage. Jesus is basically saying you can't save yourself. That's just the way it is. You need something outside of yourself. Number eight, how many people did Jesus miraculously feed in the Gospel of Mark? 9,000. 9,000. Well, Actually, I should have put C also, because 5 plus 4 equals 9, but it is two feedings, 5,000 and 4,000, but Teresa is right, C is technically correct, <laughs> and I should have been smart enough to, to see that. Now, in fairness, D is possible because on this one it says 5,000 men right. and it now it could have been just men it's possible but it also could have been their families were there and if their families were there that means 15,000 
is possible. And then you could, you could even say maybe 19,000, you know, who knows? Um, we'll have to ask when we get to glory. But right now we're gonna go with uh, the answer as it stands right here with uh, A, B, and C. Okay, last one. Which of the following describes Mark's style of writing? Now, if you get this wrong, except for Liz, hang your head in shame because we've had this question over and over again. <laughs> At least you should get one of them right. Just the facts, ma'am. By the way, what is that TV show that that comes from? Dragnet. Dragnet, excellent. I don't know how old I am. I could, yeah, well, I know it too. <laughs> Sophisticated Greek, aimed at the Greeks, aimed at the Romans. And it's A and D is what I was looking for. A and D. It was aimed at the Romans. He wrote it from Rome. Mark probably used Peter as his source. We uh, talked about that. And Just the Facts, ma'am, is his brief style. It is the shortest of all the Gospels. And uh, that covers that. So today is a passage that I will admit is a hard one. It's a hard one to teach. It's a hard one to understand. And quite honestly, because of that, there are like 80 different opinions on this passage. So Jesus, this, this is what happens when you talk about the end times. I mean, here, here is some statement. Some people are pre-tribulation. Some people are mid-tribulation. Some people are post-tribulation. Some people are amillennial. Some people are preterists. Now, does anyone know about all of those here? No. Liz, you raise your hand, so. I'm, I know, I don't. That's it. Oh, oh, that was just like, God help us. <laughs> now, the reason, reason I'm some of you have heard of some. Like, if you've heard of the phrase pre trib rapture of the church or pre tribulation rapture of the church, if you read any of the left behind books, that fits in that category. But the, rea the reality is there's so many different opinions about the end times. And this passage, Jesus is doing two things. He's talking about what's going to happen in the near future. Near future meaning in the next 30 years. And he's talking about what we, many perceive as the distant future. In other words, the second coming of Jesus. And they're kind of interwoven as he tells the story. But I'm going to give you the best I can do in terms of describing this. But there is another principle I want you to keep in mind. So let me ask you a general question. The book of the Revelation, the last book in the Bible, what do you think its primary purpose is? Hope. Give this man a, you know, a praise. Don said hope. Nobody ever says that. You are amazing. Death and destruction. <laughs> Most people, when they think of the Revelation, say, what is primary purpose? Tell us what's going to happen in the future. What its primary purpose is, is John is telling us that God is coming to take this upside down world and make it right side up. He's coming to fix the wreckage. And everybody misses the forest because they're so consumed with the trees. You know, what's this uh, bowl mean? What's this judgment mean? What's this? And they get so caught up in that. And then they speculate. Do you think this thing is a helicopter that's being described? Do you think this thing is? And they get obsessed with this stuff. But it has one simple meaning. So yesterday I'm at my father-in-law's graveside and I quoted Revelation 21 and he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more sickness, and there will be no more death. He who writes this is faithful and true. I am the first and last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. When you hear these from the words of Jesus, mouth of Jesus, it makes a funeral a little easier that there is gonna be a time when there's no more death and there's no more sickness and there are no more tears. But meanwhile, we get caught up in the previous chapters of, oh my goodness, look at the, the plagues and this and the, you know, and we're, we're all consumed. But all he's saying is, I'm coming to judge. 
I'm going to fix what's broken in this world. And in, in Revelation chapter 5, remember there's a scroll that is perfectly sealed with seven seals. And nobody was worthy to open it. And John weeps because nobody's worth it. In our mind, we like, why is he weeping? What's the scroll? What's the big deal? The scroll is God's movement, God's judgments. And he weeps because if the scroll isn't open, the world remains crappy. But if the seals are broken, the world is going to be fixed. And that's why John, isolated on the island of Patmos, is so wanting for God to come and fix this broken world. I mean, right now we look at the stuff in the Middle East. We look at the, you know, the Ivy League colleges and the, you know, the protests and the and the economy and you go all down the line as to what people are anxious over. And what you have is God saying, "I'm going to fix it." So in this passage, Jesus is giving us things to keep in mind. But as we look at this passage, it really boils down to one simple thing. Keep your eyes open and watch how you live. Keep your eyes open, watch how you live. The other stuff is kind of like details that we can't figure out. But if you can just do the things you can do, that's how we move. That's what we do. So I'm going to read the first section, which is actually a long section because it's the entire chapter. <laughs> so I'm going to read through it, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. Now, the heading says the destruction of the temple and the signs of the end times, which pretty much covers it. So here we go. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, Jesus replied, or replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out, that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. You must be in your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand what you will say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and a father, his child, children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one who was on a housetop, go down and enter the house or take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their coat. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning. When God created the world until now and never to be equaled again, if the Lord had cut short those days, no one would survive. If he hadn't cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he had chosen, he has shortened them. At uh, that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be in your guard. 
I have told you everything ahead of time, but in those days, the following that distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. He will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as the twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you will know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will surely not pass away until all the things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, and whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. All right, thank God Don is here to help explain this because he had revelation all figured out, so we can uh, use this. Do you, do you see what I mean? It's not an easy passage here, not an easy passage, but there are some things I'm going to show you now which are going to be fun, interesting, to make this passage come to life a little bit. So first of all, this is a picture that is uh, the Olivet Discourse, Know the Signs. Now, this picture is giving you a feel that Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, which overlooks Jerusalem. So they just come out of the temple and they're passing the Temple Mount. And you remember when one of the disciples says, my, what huge stones. Now, having been there, the stones are the size of this table, four of them together. If you can imagine foundation stones that big holding up the temple, it's impressive. It's impressive to this day when you go there. Like, how many people did it take to move those stones? I just moved into the car, you know, quarters. <laughs> they weighed so much. You know, I, if you think of a, a stone that is as big as this table, including the distance to the floor, unbelievable. So what's wrong with this picture, though, based on the scripture? Anyone pick up with it? So picture, this is Jerusalem. It's an artist configuration. This is like the, the Temple Mount over here. But it is called the Olivet Discourse because he's giving it on the Mount of Olives. He's supposed to be sitting and he's standing. That's good. That's good. When Jesus teaches, he usually is sitting because that's a Jewish style. Excellent point. It's that this conversation is private. It is James, Peter, John, and Andrew. He spoke privately to him. So when you see this, this was not the masses hearing this. And this is conveying that it's a big group of people that are there. I thought I'd show the picture though because it does give the image of you're on one hill overlooking another hill. So we go on and I want you to see this picture. What stands out when you see this picture? Twin Towers. Yeah. Twin Towers. It's funny, ever, I'm right, right now my wife and I are watching an old TV show from the 80s called The Equalizer. And there have been movies made since and there's a new Equalizer on TV. But back then, you know, because we're watching this old TV show, every time they show the panoramic view of New York City, you see the Twin Towers. They were built in the, I think, 1972, 73. Mm -hmm. I've had the chance to go up with them. But now every time I see them, I get melancholy. Because it doesn't matter that I'm watching a TV show. I'm like, <sighs> just makes me sad, you know, when I see that. I'm showing you this because 
That's what they're seeing when they look at Jerusalem. They're seeing the way it is then. But just imagine Jesus is on the, you know, Staten Island, and we're all overlooking New York, Manhattan Island. And he says, those towers, not one stone will be left on another. It would be unbelievable, you know, would make sense. I mean, it would be so many feelings that would be associated with that that you just couldn't comprehend. And I'm showing you this because we in our culture, in our day, have the ability to get a little bit of that feeling. Just looking at this picture as to what Jesus is actually saying. So here is the temple in their time. So this is, of course, an artist's description of it. This is the Antonia Fortress. So the Romans were always very close because they figured the Jewish people, they are, you know, prone to revolt. And this has so much room. You can fit in this section here like 70,000 people. It is massive, absolutely massive. Um, and here is the temple itself. A priest goes in once a day to the first part of the temple, this part here, where it is called the holy place. And then the Holy of Holies on the back end of this has this very big thick curtain that only the high priest can go in once a year. And then this is what's called the Court of the Women. Over here is where the sacrifices take place. And this is called the Court of the Gentiles only because everyone can go there um, in that. This is according to Josephus where everyone entered in. This building here, this is so cool to me, this is where the purification baths are. Then they have been excavated and you can actually see where Mary purified herself when the 40 days came to celebrate the birth of her baby Jesus. These tanks are, have been all unearthed just within the last 25, 30 years. It, it's exciting to me to actually see that. But this is basically, here's the foundation this will stay. The Temple Mount stays. That's what's there to this day. This, everything up here, gone. So this now is the Roman road. When you go to, if you went to Israel in 1979, all the dirt level was up to here. But archaeologists came in after the Six Day War, 1968, and they started digging in the early 80s. They, uh, excuse me, the late 80s, they began excavating this section. And these are the stones from the Temple Mount, just part of them that were found. Now that is for me moving because it's like you're seeing a piece of history. This here is a piece of what is now called Robinson's Gate. It was another entrance into the temple that more dignitaries went into. And we knew of it in antiquity. You know, we read about it, but we didn't have her see where it was. And it was unearthed. And now they found it. This is the actual Roman road. This is just another close up of the stones themselves. This is the temple mount. Now look at the stone. That is like this table, just to give you perspective of size. That's how big this is, massive. This is to me very cool. So this is an artist's rendition of where they would blow the trumpet on the pinnacle of the temple. I'm gonna show you where that is over here. That would be like over here. They would blow the trumpet on the top of the temple to signal the beginning of what? Sabbath. So on Friday evening at sunset, and that means all the Jewish community stop working. And there are certain things defined by the law as work. Some things are not work. Eating is not work. They don't view that as eating. But, but there are things that you no longer do. Anyway, getting back to this, that is what this is a, um, uh, an artist's rendition of. This I told you about last week. So this was found right in this area. 
and it says on it right there to the place of trumpeters which means we know where it came from it came from the pinnacle of the temple and if you remember when Jesus was tempted Satan took him to the pinnacle of the temple and said throw yourself off the scriptures say the angels will keep watch over you and you know he also says look around all this can be yours if you bow down to me so when this artifact was found it was so cool because when I stood next to it I'm like Jesus stood next to this it was just kind of special for me now here's the downer part of it this is a, a recreation they put it back in the site so people know where they found it but the real one is in the Israel Museum which I also saw but it's and pretty much anything in the ancient world that has writing on it they want to put it in a museum because they want they don't want the, the letters to fade off with rain and you know storms but it really is a piece of history so this guy here his name is Titus and Titus was a, was a Caesar who conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple does anyone know what year he did this 70. 70 AD exactly so when Jesus speaks of not one stone left on another it's this guy who did it now here's another interesting thing this is an arch in Rome anyone been to Rome oh, yeah. you have okay you may have seen this but it depicts the destruction of Jerusalem if you look at the side panel here there it is see the menorah oh. this is celebrating in Rome his conquest of the Jewish people oh, in other the words Ark, the yep uh -huh. he is celebrating it and rejoicing that he destroyed Jerusalem so this is where your Bible and history intersects in a very powerful way these things happened in place and time so I'm gonna leave that there for now and now we're gonna look at the passage with a little more detail as Jesus was uh, leaving the temple one of his disciples said look teacher what massive stones what magnificent buildings and it must have been amazing to see it I mean we wish we could see it all we have are the pictures of artists and it is Titus and he is the son of the Emperor Vespasian Ves how would you pronounce it uh, V A V E S P A S I A N Vespian anyway Titus is his son and Jesus replies do you see these great buildings not one stone here will be left on another everyone will be thrown down in fact just for seeing seeing the stones here makes it feel very real as you're reading this so if Christ was crucified 30 AD. 30 AD. Yeah. So that roughly. It was, you know, just 40 years later. Yes. Exactly. Now, a quick word. Uh, when I went to Stony Brook University, I was a religion major, um, religion and Judaic studies. And many of the, I'll call them liberal scholars, unbelieving scholars, they would argue that Mark was written in the 70s or 80s AD for this very passage because how could Mark have known that the temple was going to be destroyed? In other words, if you're making your uh, studies in linguistics based on a presupposition that you can't know the future then he must have wrote it after it happened but it's impossible and I'm going to show you how now which two books use a lot of Mark's material uh, no no that's a previous book Matthew and Luke 
They quote Mark extensively. Now, Luke wrote two books. Luke and what else? Acts. Acts. Now, which book came first? He wrote Luke first. How do we know that? Because Acts begins, my dear Theophilus, as I wrote in my former work, which is Luke, about the life of Jesus, now I'm going to tell you about the church and how it began. So the book of Acts ends in chapter 28 where Paul is alive and in captivity in Rome. And we know he was beheaded based on church history, 67, 68 BC. So if Luke and Matthew are using a lot of sections of Mark, and if Luke writes his book before the book of Acts, and if Paul is still alive at the end of the book of Acts, that means Mark is well before the destruction of the temple that he wrote his book. There's no other way to come, any other conclusion to reach, which means that when we read Jesus saying this, he happens to know what's going to happen in the future. That all of this is going to be destroyed. And it makes it very powerful. It, makes, it gives you like evidence for what's taking place and what Jesus is saying. Now, I'll be the first to say that what Jesus says is kind of cryptic to me. You know, I find a lot of things he's saying is going right over my head. You know, or I, I can't figure it out. But the destruction of the temple is black and white clear because he says that. And that's exactly what happens. You can see the stones behind me. Trivia question. What's sitting on the Temple Mount now? Uh, Dome of the Rock. Dome of the Rock. Don's hitting on all cylinders no, today. Was oh, who's? That was Mike. Oh, Mike? Okay. I'm giving Don credit for your wisdom <laughs> there, but he made it understandable to me. He's my puppet. Okay, there we go. <laughs> But yes, exactly. But also, for those of you, the Dome of the Rock, is it a mosque or not? No. It is not. <coughs> the Alaska Mosque is up there. That's the mosque. The Dome of the Rock is really a commemoration piece. Some will say a propaganda piece commemorating where Muhammad ascended to heaven, came back down, and it says when in Arabic around it, it says, God has not begotten, nor does he beget, which is picking on what? that Jesus is the only begotten of God. So it's actually a, a statement trying to put down Christianity on the Dome of the Rock. Anyway, moving on, he says, um, not one stone will be left in another. Verse three, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. So we have the vista that he's, that he's seeing. Peter, James, John, Andrew asked him privately, so now comes the private conversation and he's, t you know, uh, let's see here. Tell us when these things will happen. He doesn't really answer that one. That would have been nice. But the next one he answers. And what will the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, now here comes a phrase that shows up five times in this chapter watch out. So a friend of mine, a pastor, a friend of mine, he says, Steve, you like to preach the verbs. And I do. I like the verbs because it's, it's where you can hang your hat. What am I supposed to do? And so I do like to preach the verbs. Um, but in this case, if you want to know in this confusing <coughs> passage, what is my job? I got to watch out. I got to keep my eyes open. Not paying attention to things is not a wise thing to do. Watch out, and here's the first one, that no one deceives you. Many will come claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. Josephus, the Jewish historian who lived in the first century, he gives numerous examples in his book called The Antiquities of people claiming to be Messiah. And it was something that happened then. Does it happen now? Yeah, I think it does. 
Where does the phrase, he drank the Kool-Aid, come from? Jim Jones. Yep. It, well, once again, we give our age when we know these things. You know, but it's be, it became in our culture a metaphor that, like my daughter, probably didn't even know the origins of the metaphor. But we now, you know, a different generation, we know the origins of the metaphor. It was when somebody followed a very charismatic leader, even to the point that they were all willing, I think there were 900 of them or something, mm -hmm. willing to take their own lives in following this person. And so in that, Jesus is saying, should you be careful about what's coming in through your ear and eye gate? Yes. So if you're watching something on TV, some charismatic speaker, just because they're a good communicator, have the litmus test of knowing the Word of God and measuring it to what they're saying. Because if it doesn't sound right, be careful. Be careful. By the way, since you're not all Bible scholars, what would be a way to like check on that? Read your Bible. One, one read your Bible. That'd be a good one. But it's a big book. It's a big book. Check with Pastor Steve. Yeah, check with Pastor Steve. <laughs> My point is, if there's somebody in your life who might know a little bit more, ask them, what do you think of this person? I remember when I was at uh, a camp in upstate New York called Word of Life. And uh, it was founded by a very charismatic uh, uh, evangelist named Jack Wurtson back in the 40s. And uh, Jack Wurtson, when I went to camp, I worked there, um, he was probably in his mid-60s, early 70s, something like that. And so I'm at this camp, and there was a person that a lot of the campers were listening to, meaning the staff, that were really into what he was saying. And to me, it smelled a little funny. Just smelled funny. Do you guys ever watch Saturday Night Live, you know, back in the day? I never see it now, but back in the day, there was a skit. I can't really do it completely because it has a bad word in it. But this one man is teaching his like son. He said, this here is Shinola. You put it on your shoes, you buff it, it makes your shoes very nice. This here is, and then he says S-H-I-T. The important thing in life is to know the difference between Shinola and he says, this, you don't want to put in your shoe. And the point is they look similar. You know, they look similar. And whenever you hear a teacher, see if you can understand the difference between Shinola and the other. Because there is a lot of bogus stuff. Like, for example, I would say your, your meter should be going up if 70% of the program is about how much money you should send it. Just like it smells a little funny, you know, if that is what. We understand that ministries cost money. We get that. People give to the church. We get that. But we also have open finances. We also, you know, people can all know what the pastor makes or, you know, what Pastor Seth makes, all that stuff. It's not hidden. And when you find things are murky on that or when they're teaching things that just smell like yesterday's diapers, be careful. And that's what Jesus is saying. Watch out, because there are people out to deceive you. Is that true now as it was then? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, therefore we got one thing on this confusing passage we can take to the bank. Watch out. He goes on. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen. So in our lifetimes, have we heard of wars and rumors of wars? We certainly have. Probably this has been through world history, you know, in terms of what's going on. What does Jesus say? Don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. Remember Jesus taught, teaches time and time again, don't worry. You know, about tomorrow, you got enough things to worry about today. So why are we spending all this time worrying about tomorrow? I, I am going through something right now, which I'm finding interesting. I've shared with you. I, as a pastor, I have like no secrets. I tell you all my junk. But one of the things that I'm dealing with, I just inherited through Michelle's dad resources we didn't have before. 
you know what I am finding? Having a little bit more money makes me cautious. Do we have enough for the future? Why? That's absurd to me. We have more than we did previously, but now I'm thinking, well, how do we make this last till we die? You know, kind of thing. And I'm like, Lord, I actually confessed to God. I said, help us not depend on money. Wall Street for the last two weeks. In fact, this came up at the board of directors meeting. Wall Street took a plummet. You know, I think the, I think our resource commission, we had 900 and something. Now we have 800 and something in the bank. I mean, we in one few days, we went down tens of thousands of dollars, you know, as, as to what happened. If you get consumed on that stuff, what happens? We get anxious. When you hear of wars and stuff like that, Jesus' recommendation, don't be anxious. Why? He knows the beginning from the end. He knows how long you're going to live. He knows. And so what Michelle and I are doing, and this is the fun part, we decided one of the ways you fight against this is give money away. And so we are looking at different ministries and we're giving early inheritance to our kids. We're, we're doing things to help us not depend on money because I don't want to ever depend on money over the Lord. And that's, an ex that's a muscle you have to exercise. And if you don't, you can get stingy. And I don't want to be stingy. There are actual studies that say churches that are generous have generous pastors. Churches that are stingy have stingy pastors. They don't even know what the connection is. But there is this connection. Therefore, I don't want to be the latter, <laughs> you know, in terms of what do we do to nurture generosity? One thing is just exercise the giving muscle on a personal level. It's a cool thing. So anyway, Jesus says, don't worry, because wars are going to come. There will be earthquakes in various places. New York had an earthquake three weeks ago. My daughter called me in the middle of it. Daddy, what does this mean? It means your room is shaking for a few seconds. It'll stop. Don't worry. And in New York, the earthquakes are like useless. They don't do anything. New York City. Yes. New York City, the whole, that area all had a significant earthquake. I think it was like seven. I don't think it was that much. What was it? I don't think it was that hot. No, I think you're right. I think, I think it was in the fours, now that I think of it. I think it was in the fours. But the bottom line is the stones there are not brittle like West Coast stones. They're just like solid granite and they just kind of shake a little bit like jelly and then it stops. And it, you know, rarely is any big deal. But um, anyway, earthquakes happen. Jesus says, breathe in, breathe out. These are birth pangs. All of creation is crying out for the restoration of all things, the reversal of the curse. You know, the curse happened in Genesis 3. All this junk we have in our world is part of that. But he goes on, you must be on your guard. Does that sound like watch out? Yeah. Sounds a lot like that. You will be handed over to local councils and flogged in synagogues. Now what happens is at first in the Roman world, the Romans viewed Christians as a sect of Judaism. And Judaism was a protected religion. But eventually the Jewish leaders they don't want to be associated with these Christians. And so they're, they're trying to separate. And so that's where this flogging in the synagogues. And the book of Acts will talk about Paul going before King Agrippa as an example. So if you and I are ever in that situation where we are asked to give account for our faith, what does Jesus say is going to happen? He goes on. And it says that just say whatever is given to you at the time, verse, verse 11, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. So here's the promise of Jesus. If that ever happens to us, who's going to help us? The Holy Spirit. And when Paul was before Agrippa, and he gives this whole conversion message to Agrippa, and Agrippa says to him, Paul, do you think in such a short time you're going to convert me? And he says, short time, long time, doesn't matter. 
A fun book to read, by the way, is Billy Graham's autobiography, Just As I Am. It's a long book, but it is interesting to read. But he's so honorable because he only tells you backstories of everyone who's died, not people who are still alive. Because he met every living leader, like everywhere. But he tells one story of Haile Selassie, if I have his name correct. He was like the king or emperor of Ethiopia at the time. And he's going to be doing crusade in Africa there. And he is invited to see the king. So he says in his book, this is the way he puts it. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm budgeted for 20 minutes. For the first five, I have to be cordial and just, you know, let him talk about his family, my family. Then the second five minutes, uh, we're going to talk about what's going to happen here in the country. You know, we're going to have this crusade. We're going to have thousands of people. But on those last 10 minutes, I need to tell him about Jesus. And Billy Graham said every conversation, that was what he was driven. I want to tell this person about Jesus. Because who has access to talk to emperors and kings? That's something that was unique to him. And he owned that responsibility. So I want to go back to the beginning of that section again. It says, on account of me, verse 9, you will stand before governors, kings, as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. The gospel must first be preached to all nations. Now let me ask you a question. Can you think of any nation in the world right now that there hasn't been the gospel proclaimed? The answer is it's been proclaimed in every single nation. But the Greek word is ethnos. In other words, every little group in every little nation. Where I, when I was a part of uh, one of the chairmen for the last Billy Graham crusade, it was held in Flushing, New York. And in Flushing, New York, there are 150 different people groups. 150 different language people groups just in Flushing, New York. I mean, New York is the big melting pot of the nation, you know, so it's not surprising in that sense. But when you understand, the answer is the gospel has been given to every nation, but not every single ethnic group. And if you ever go to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, they have this really cool demonstration of where you see books on a wall and they show you every Bible translation that's been of everyone but they show you there's still all these people groups that don't have a Bible. And they show you these blank books. In other words, they never receive. And so Wycliffe Bible translators and other groups are there translating the Bible. And so Jesus is saying that this will eventually be to all groups. Now, when you're hearing this and you're just an average Joe, how do I contribute to the gospel being heard in all the world? Well, I could talk to Don about what missionaries we support, you know, and what can we do. Maybe I can write a check, you know, to Wycliffe Bible translators or something like that. Did I tell you the story about Cory Booker? Um, he's the senator from New Jersey, and um, it's a fun little story. He, he's he used to be on the city council of uh, Newark. And when he was in the city council, um, he represented one little borough. And the people all asked Corey to go before the city council and ask for more police protection in their area because of all the drug transactions that were going on in that area. And so he said, I'll do it. He went to the city council. He made his case. He comes back. His constituents are waiting for him, and they say, Corey, what happened? And he said, they voted me down. Well, what do we do now? He says, I don't know. I'm frustrated and discouraged. A woman comes up to him and says, Corey, I know exactly what you need to do. And he goes, okay, tell me. What do we need to do? And she didn't say anything. So he says, I'm moving on. He walks to his apartment building. She follows him. And he walks, she walks into the apartment building with him. 
and says, Corey, I know exactly what you need to do. He says, okay, tell me, what do we need to do? She didn't say anything. So he pushes the elevator button, he gets in. She gets in with him. And he says, you know, this elevator is going to my floor, and then I am getting out, and then I'm walking to my door, I'm going to unlock it and close the door with you on the other side of it. And she goes, this is your last chance. Cora, I know exactly what you need to do. And he goes, okay, door's about to open. And this is what she said, do something. Thank you so much for that great piece of wisdom. <laughs> but as he entered his apartment, he thought to himself, she's right. There is always something you can do. He got the neighborhood together and says, we all know where the drug transactions are taking place. They're taking place on the abandoned lot. Who has a lawnmower? I got one. Who likes to plant bushes and, and flowers? I can do that. Who does? They, together as a community, cleared out all the junk, all the bush, you know, the tall grass where all the trun grass, uh, tran transactions were taking place, and they made it a little garden spot. They didn't care who owned the land, they're just making it nice. All the drug dealers moved to a different part of town. They did something. That, for me, has been pivotal when I heard that in my ministry. Because, like, how do you grow a church? That's a fair question. How do you grow a church? The simplest answer is do something. You know what you do? If you don't have an AA group, start an AA group. Start grief share. Start other things that draw people to church. Uh, do, you know, make your sermon better. You know, all these things that you can do to make another reason for people to come. So the reason I'm telling you this is because as a pastor and as a leader, there are times where I thought, how do I, this little guy, impact the whole world? How do you do? You do something. So I had this idea for Long Island. So Long Island has, when you add up all the people, it's about 8 million people live in Long Island. It's 118 miles long, about 30 miles wide. And so I'm thinking, how do we do this? And I got this idea. I invited all the lead churches from all of Long Island to my church. And uh, so churches of like 500, you know, 200, 2,000, that all came to one room. Picture a room like this. And I put on the wall, the size of this wall here, a map of Long Island. And I said, everybody put your church on the map. Where is your church? And so we filled it all different parts of the island. And I said, where is Long Island not reaching people? You know, where are we like not succeeding? And um, people gave different talks. And then I looked at this town, get a kick out of this. One of the towns Long Island is called Babylon. <laughs> Long Island has a lot of those kind of names. We have Beth Page, Long Island. We have, you know, all these biblical names. We have Jericho. Um, but anyway, I, I made this comment. Look at Babylon. There's no church ministry there within 10 miles of Babylon. There was a church planter in that meeting, and he was trying to decide, where shall I plant my church? And when I made that comment that there's nothing in Babylon, he thought, I think I'll plant the church in Babylon. So he plants, but then he comes to me and says, but where in Babylon, I don't have any money. And I said, well, there's this little tiny Baptist church, only has like 35 people. Meet with them, maybe they would like to partner with you. That guy, that pastor of that little tiny church, met the church planter. He says, I wanna partner with you. Um, uh, you and a, a, a whole congregation of 35 endorses what you're gonna do. And then he died of a heart attack within a month or so of that conversation. But because the pastor blessed it before he died, the church gave the new planter the keys of the church. This was seven years ago. This past Easter, that church had 1,500 people. I was blown away. His name is Lou, Lou Pizzicello. 
He called me up the day after Easter. He said, Steve, what do I do? I don't have the room in the building. <laughs> they had like four or five services. Their church is just a little bit bigger than this. Four or five services, and they used the Fellowship Hall. They used you know, everything they could conceive of and did it four, four or five times over in one day. <laughs> My point in this story, though, is all I sought to do was something. I don't have the answer on how to reach, you know, Boulder City for Jesus or something like that. But all of us, we can do something. And so you think, why is that something? So that to me makes like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That's it. How do you reach the world for Christ? One person at a time. And you know, the simplest thing could be invite somebody to church. I love when somebody comes to me on Sunday, Pastor Steve, let me introduce you to somebody. I invited them to come and they came today. Ah, so good to meet you. And, you know, and so we meet and we talk. That's all it comes down to. So when Jesus speaks of this and the gospel must first be preached to all nations, I hope you keep that Cory Booker story in mind. Do something. You can do something. We move on. And he speaks of a very difficult thing. Brother will betray brother to death. Father and children. Children will be against their parents. And everyone will hate you because of me. But those who stand firm to the end will be saved. Now, on that statement, there are times when this happens. I don't know if you heard of the Cultural Revolution in China. But in the Cultural Revolution under Mao Zedong, parents were encouraged to turn in their children. Children were encouraged to turn in their parents and they would be brought into education camps to be realigned to what they're supposed to believe and what they're supposed to know. This kind of thing has happened and will it happen again? Probably. It, it feels that way even now with certain things in our country where we have these re-education seminars that employees have to go to and to go through. But now he mentions something which is a real mystery. He says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Does anyone have any idea where that phrase comes from? Mike? <laughs> it's actually a quote from Daniel. And it comes from Daniel 9, 27. Daniel 9, 27. And this actually happened uh, from a guy named Antichus the fourth Epiphanes, Antichus Epiphanes. What he did, he was one of the Seleucids. Now, who was a Seleucid? It's when they, uh, they came in and they sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. That is correct. And they put an idol of Zeus in the temple. So this happened, I think it's 167, AD, uh, 164, well, 167 BC. One of, remember when uh, Alexander the Great conquered the world? After he died, his conquests all were divided into like relatives. And in this area, it was the Seleucids. And one of the Seleucids just hated the Jews and he desecrated the temple. And that was, became the phrase, the abomination that causes desolation. And that seems to be what Daniel is referring to. So since Jesus is speaking after that fact, he would know of that event. That because that happened before Jesus. What he seems to be saying here is something like that is going to happen, which implies that the temple will be rebuilt at some point, which has not happened to our generation. And so this is what point to some people saying this is yet to happen in the future. So the temple destruction is kind of like the beginning of the end times. And then this desecration of perhaps a new temple will be at the end of the times. 
All of this, by the way, now falls into which view of the end times do you have? Which now we're going to get murky. And so all I want to say is, what's the verb? Watch out. You know, how you live. He goes on. Let no one who's a housetop go under, un, enter the house or take anything out. Let no one who's in a field go back and get their cloak. Um, basically, this is all that when you see things getting this bad, get out of Dodge when, when you're seeing that. Verse 20, if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. Now let's uh, ask a little question here. Who's the elect? The saved. Saved. saved people. Now, here's a little question. So I'm born and I find out uh, that God has a, a predestined who will be saved and who will not be saved. So why bother? I mean, why, why try? So. David, how do you know if you're elect or not? If you feel the Holy Spirit is working. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Here's the way, what you have in Scripture is what I would call a holy tension. Here's what it says. Share your faith, accept Jesus, and lo and behold, when you do, wow, I guess you're one of the elect. From our perspective, it's just the choice to follow Jesus. Now, God knows who's going to be in that group, and that's referred to as the elect. But from our perspective, it is our choice to watch out, to keep your eye open, to keep looking. And so that's the tension that we find in Scripture. There is such a thing as the elect. That's us. That's believers. But the elect are elect because they chose to follow Jesus. So it's responsibility of man and the responsibility of God working together. And so we, we see this in this passage. Now the idea of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, popular in, in the Tim LaHaye books, comes from a verse like this that these people will be, the, you know, the world will be protected because they're here and that they will be taken up by the angels. We'll, we'll read on. We move on. He talks once again. At that time, if somebody says to you, look, here's a Messiah. Look, there he is. Do not believe it. False messiahs, false prophets will appear. Perform signs and wonders to deceive, even if possible, the elect. Now, that's an interesting phrase, if possible. Is it possible to deceive the elect? Well, some will actually argue yes, and others will say no. In other words, they mean this, the elect can't fall. You might have heard a phrase, once saved, always saved, or another phrase, which is eternal security. This is another thing that Christians debate over. Can you fall away? And um, I would like to say that Paul says in Colossians chapter one, that he will present you holy and pure before the throne of God if you remain steadfast in the faith. In other words, if your faith is solid, you don't have to worry about being saved. You're saved. But where I have to be cautious, let's say a mother tells me, I know my son lived a life like the devil, but when he was five years old, he prayed to receive Jesus in his heart, and I know he's saved now. Now, I hope he is. I do. But I'm not going to hang my hat on that. Somebody asked me just this week, um, relating to their dad, they said, do you think my dad's in hell? Because their dad was not a, a great guy. He abandoned the family, um, all kinds of messy stuff. And I said to her, I said, don't try to think, send your dad to hell. I said, it's not for you to send him to hell. It's not for you to send him to heaven either. That's what we trust a merciful God for. Now it says in Psalm 130, beautiful Psalm, it says, O Lord, hear my cry for mercy. O Lord, if you kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore we reverence you. So the psalmist says, if it was up to our sins, none of us have a chance. None of us. 
but God chooses to be known by his mercy. And so when it comes to those messy things of, you know, kids we have or parents or all that kind of stuff, don't send anyone to hell, don't send anyone to heaven, but know this, God chooses to know himself by his mercy. And if that's the way he reveals himself, that's where I'm hanging my hat. Because I know for myself, I need mercy. I need it big time. And so that's what I hang on to. So moving on, he says, so be in your guard. There it is again. Watch out. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, the following that distress, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. The heavenly bodies will be shaken. He's quoting here two quotes, Isaiah 13, 10 and Isaiah 34, 4. And he's kind of combining them together. And then it says what sounds like the rapture. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth, and from the ends of the heavens. So this is, if you are a pre-trib person, this is the rapture. And the question is, how much tribulation happens before then? How much happens after? Thus you have pre-tribulation rapture folks, mid-tribulation rapture folks, post-tribulation rapture folks. And all of it is uh, all unfolding. And by the way, don't worry about that. I know it sounds confusing. Don't, don't even be consumed. What's the verb you need to watch in this passage? And I said it in my question. Watch. watch. That's the command. Don, what are you going to say? The Isaiah passage. In Isaiah 13.10 and Isaiah 34.4. Now I want to show you a few other things here. Okay, this is Antichus Epiphanes. He erected an altar of a Greek god, Zeus, in the middle of the Israelite temple and sacrificed a pig, both items strictly forbidden in Jewish law. According to this article from the Encyclopedia Britannica, he regarded himself as Zeus, a manifestation of a god, and thus wanted Israel to worship him, foreshadowing the Antichrist would do, force everyone into a false worship of God. Antichrist meaning the future. He outlawed circumcision under penalty of death, which is funny because that's being discussed by the San Francisco City Council. <laughs> not penalty of death. <laughs> that they're not talking about. And forced the Jews to sacrifice to the Greek gods. He killed a great many of the Jews and sold many into slavery when they protested his abomination of desolation. So people think that what happened before Jesus, Jesus is alluding to what will happen in the future. Now, it says in the passage that the generation that sees the beginning of these things will not pass away. This is verse 30. So now, learn the lesson of the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender, its leaves come out, you know the summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happen, know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, the generation, that generation will not pass away until all things have happened. So what does that mean? So I'm showing you, there are five proposed interpretations of that. One is, some think this generation refers to the disciples who were alive when Jesus was speaking to them. Next, others see these all things, a prediction with multiple fulfillments, so that Jesus' disciples will be both this generation that sees the destruction of the temple in AD and 70 AD, and also those at the end of the age who see these events surrounding the abomination of desolation. Number three, this generation of believers throughout the entire present age or this evil generation will remain until Christ is returned. That's speaking of it in a general term. Others, particularly dispensational interpreters, understand the generation to mean race. This is another Greek sense of genea, uh, which is, which race are you? And think it refers to the Jewish people who will not pass away until Christ returns. And others understand this generation to mean that the generation that sees all these things, namely the generation is alive when the final period of the Great Tribulation begins. 
Now, I know this is all like, what in the world did you just say, Pastor Steve? But let me give you a very clear example that people hold to. Um, what happened in 1948? Very big event. Israel became a nation. Very good. Israel became a nation and Mike was born. To okay, good, good. <laughs> so in light of that, many thought that because it seems to be a fulfillment of prophecy, that Israel would once again become a nation. And it does, you know, there is good biblical evidence to make that case. But they think that the generation began at that event. And which is why the Jesus in the 70s, there was this high anticipation of the second coming of Jesus. Because if Israel became a nation, a generation in the Old Testament is generally viewed as 40 years, you add 40 years and you're now at this late 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, and when Jesus is coming back. And so there was this high anticipation of the second coming of Christ. And so people were watching for signs. Israel becomes a nation and they go, sounds like a sign to me. And they're anticipating. Is that the fulfillment of this? I don't know. But I do know this. Watch out. Jesus told me to watch out. So do I pay attention that Israel became a nation? I do. It's one of the things I also pay attention to war upon war. I pay attention to earthquakes. I keep an eye on these kinds of things. Now, this I wanted to show you because this is a picture that was taken last June in New York. And it's a little hard to see because of the bright light coming in. But this, do you remember last uh, June, Canada had all these fires that were burning and the smoke covered the entire Midwest all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. I went to New York for my mother's funeral. We came out of the funeral and the smoke had rolled in. I had never seen anything like it in my life. Just imagine walking out of this church and you can't see the street lights. There's such thick smoke from Canada of all places. But at night when the, when the moon was full moon, that's what we saw. And you look at the revelation speaking of a blood moon. And I was thinking, wow, if war causes smoke and smoke changes the way we, you don't see any stars. Remember the text says the stars will fall from the sky. This could be that kind of language being described. And so in New York, I'll tell you, everyone was thinking of the end of days when we saw this in the sky. It was creepy. I mean, I just never saw anything in my life. And you know, I was 62 years old at the time. I've lived a little while and I never saw anything like that. And you, the, you, in terms of sky and stuff, yeah, yeah. the smoke inundated everything. The, the, the sun was red like that, and real dim down and stuff. Hmm. It's creepy when you see that. What I've been seeing here so far is some nasty sand stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, dust. It's like you can't even see Las Vegas anymore. <laughs> so anyway, um, this I'm going to leave on as we wrap up. Um, it comes down to this, the last section, but about the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. So here he says again, be on your guard, be alert. You do not know what time, uh, he will come. It is like a man going away. He leaves his house. He puts his servants in charge, each one with their assigned task and tells the one at the door, keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether evening, midnight, or when the rooster crows at dawn. But if he suddenly comes, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So if you're walking away from a very hard passage to understand, I would say it comes down to this. 
a note from Cory Booker, do something, do something. And when it comes to ourselves, you know what? Read my Bible, be careful who I listen to, you know, false teachers, you know, be, be watchful of those kind of things. And then just keep noting what's going on in the world. The truth is we may go home with the Lord catching us up in the clouds this afternoon, which would be fine with me, Lord, I'm cool with that. Or we might go the natural way. But we do know this, we should live our lives keeping watch. Uh, or the book of Matthew, Jesus says, keep your lamp trimmed and bright. You know, as the, 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 the virgins, I think it's seven virgins that are waiting for the return of uh, the groom. And that's what we wanna be. I, I just in close, what do you think it means to keep your lamp burning bright or what it means to watch? What would you do? Say it again. Be alert. Yeah. Notice what's happening around you. I think it's all those practical things that you've learned in Sunday school from a little girl, a little boy, and to do them and just live the life. Be compassionate, generous. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the few minutes we've had uh, talking about your word. And we will admit, Lord, that the words of your son are a little hard to understand today. But thank you for them. And I pray, Father, that you will bless us as we seek to keep watch. And maybe by your spirit, you will help us understand how we keep watch in our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming.